Hello, I'm Alice Baxter with BBC World News. Our top story, police reveal the massive haul of weapons found after America's deadliest mass shooting for three years, but still no motive. 14 people killed in California after a married couple opened fire at a social services centre. President Obama vows that the police will get to the bottom of it. It is possible that this was terrorist related, but we don't know. It's also possible that this was workplace related. The U.S. Defense Secretary announces the opening of all military combat positions to women from next year. To succeed in our mission of national defense, we cannot afford to cut ourselves off from half the country's talents and skills. We have to take full advantage of every individual who can meet our standards. Our skip the story of spaces a return to jail after South Africa's appeal court finds him guilty of murdering his girlfriend, overturning the original manslaughter verdict. And the gene therapy breakthrough which could prevent diseases being passed from one generation to the next. Very warm welcome to you now. Police in the Californian city of San Bernardino are still searching for a motive to Wednesday's mass shooting, which left 14 people dead and 21 injured. Well, the suspects, a husband and wife, dropped off their six-month-old daughter before arming themselves with assault rifles and opening fire at a social services center. They were later shot dead by police. Well, let's cross live now to California, where the uh, chief of the San Bernardino Police Department has been talking to us earlier, giving us an update on Wednesday's mass shooting investigation. But right now, let's listen to the LA director of the FBI, David Baldich. We do not know. It's, it's certainly something we're going to look into very, very carefully. What do you have about the communications that he had with, with investigative subjects, terrorism subjects that the FBI had under investigation? I did not hear you. What can you tell us about any communications he had with terrorism subjects that the FBI had been investigating? We're still working through that, and again, that goes towards the, the, the flow of the, and the pace of the information. I want to make sure we're absolutely correct but before we put that out. In the you United the United States, the FBI was we're still working through that. Six months ago, you were seeking out a broad. What did those days was he traveling to, and how long had he been? Pardon me? How, how long had he been out of the country, and what countries has he visited? It appears that he came back into the U.S. in July of 2014, as I said earlier. I do not know all the countries he visited. We know he did go to Pakistan at one point. We know she is here on a K-1 visa under a Pakistani passport. What can you tell us about a trip to Saudi Arabia? Don't have all the facts yet. Is How much do you know about her that would uh, explain why she got involved in, in this caper? We don't know enough. We do not know enough. I'm going to take two more questions. Is there any evidence that these IEDs were... How close are you to making that determination? Again, it, it would be irresponsible and premature of me to, to call this terrorism. The FBI defines terrorism in a very specifically and we are still that is the big question for us is what is the motivation for this first and foremost the integrity of this investigation again is paramount secondly it's ultimately to determine the motive and the the inspiration for this attack how did the IEDs that were found what do you how would you describe what these much of the construction was this professional or was this amateurish stuff was there high grade military explosives used there or black cover stuff well, it, I'm not an expert either, as the chief mentioned earlier, so I don't want to go too deep. I will say there is some level of sophistication, certainly, when you're tying them together and you have seemingly a uh, remote-controlled car that is attached to the device. I'm going to take one more question, and I'm going to turn it back to the chief. Yes, ma'am. Based off of any kind of designs with Inspire magazine. I didn't hear you. Any type of evidence that shows a linkage between the designs of the IEDs and Inspire magazine. We knew that question would come up, and we're looking into it as we speak. Thank you. Chief, was he ever on anybody's radar screen at all? Did you ever have any prior knowledge of him or the FBI or anybody anywhere? Uh, he was not on the radar screen of our agency uh, prior prior to yesterday. Let me let me go over a couple details. Our plan today is, uh, as I said early on, we're going to do this press conference now. 
Throughout the course of the day, we're going to do what we can to release the names of the victims, uh, focus in on those, those folks. Um, we'll probably try to get you some photos, and as I said, we're going to try to move the media a little bit closer. We will come back with another press conference at the end of the business day, 4 or 5 o'clock. Hopefully, we'll have significantly more information for you by then. Um, and then we'll kind of we'll kind of play it by ear. So with that, I'll take a couple more questions, and then I think we're going to cut it off. Did you determine that he was a suspect, and how did you determine that he was a suspect? So as I said yesterday, when we when we did our early press conferences, there was uh, we got a couple of tips, and we were following up on a couple different leads. This was one of the tips that we followed up on very early on. Where that came from was uh, another person that was in the building that knew him, that identified him by name, who expressed some concern over his behavior prior to the event and the way that he left. Following up on that information, uh, we, we discovered that he had rented a vehicle that was similar to the suspect description that we had received, and we also followed up on addresses that we had more than just that address in Redlands. But the address in Redlands is one that we followed up on, and, and the rest is obviously we know how that played out. There were there were things that, as our officers approached, gave them concern that um, I don't know if the if the word booby trapped is appropriate, but there was concern that they did not want to go in immediately. They wanted to approach it very very carefully and very tactfully, uh, tactically. And for that reason, we actually used the FBI tactical team for that because we were stretched so thin here. So the FBI came with their bomb folks. I think the sheriff's department may have helped with that component as well. And we used their team to do it. The initial officers that were there and secured the house were not the ones that made entry. We did wait until tactically they did it appropriately. Have you been able to find any notes or any type of information? Not, not, there is nothing definitive that we have right now that points directly to a motive. I don't, I'm not, I have not been made aware of any notes. We are still working on that. It, it's been a slow process. So when this happened, um, the, the, the sprinklers, the fire sprinklers in the room had actually gone off. We believe what happened is maybe one of the rounds that were fired hit the fire sprinklers, set them off, flooded the room. Uh, it took a lot of time to get that process turned off. And then we discovered the explosive devices in the room. It took a lot of time to do that. We did not get to the portion where we were dealing with the victims and the bodies and trying to make the positive identification through fingerprints until the middle of the night. We've been working throughout the night on that, uh, and we've been making notifications since then. What the sheriff plans to do is that slowly throughout the day, we will release the names, hopefully, of all 14 people today as we are able to make notifications. Anyone still in there? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not sure were, were to be honest. We're able to get to the, uh, to the victims right away. Uh, though, as of as of several hours ago, there were a few bodies left. We, we may have been able to remove those victims by now. I'm sorry, Brian. Go ahead. Yeah, were you able? To, you talk about the delay in getting to the, the bodies to the sprinklers, etc. But were you able to go in right away and you know? Uh, oh, a, a, absolutely. A, a so the initial the initial yeah. response, the officers went through the water and all that, identifying bodies, searching for suspects. All that was done. We had confirmed that those folks had lost their life, that they were dead, and then we discovered the IEDs, which caused the safety personnel to back out, deal with those in an effective way. Chief, how were you during the, um, the holiday party? Did the suspects have any conversation with the holiday goers? Not, not that I've been told. Did he say anything during the shooting? Not that I've been told. Chief, have you been able to confirm or have you been able to find out through you know, local means and the FBI a list of all the local people here in the San Bernardino area that these people may have been in touch with over a period of, say, a week, two weeks prior to this incident, or are you still reaching out to try to find those people? That, that, that is still part of that broader, more complex investigation to see if there are other co-conspirators or people that may have been aware of something. I'm just not quite prepared to give details on any of that just yet. An update on the detainee. Third person. The, so the, so at the officer-involved shooting, we did indicate that there was a person that was detained out of that. That person was, was seen running away from the scene. What we have learned since then is that uh, several of, uh, there were several police cars and undercover cars that pulled up that were engaged in that officer-involved shooting with the, with the suspects. We found out later on that there were people that were in cars that abandoned their cars and ran the other direction when the gunfire started. I don't know if that person was one of those. 
we did ultimately determine that he was not involved in the incident. He is not a suspect. He's not a person of interest. He did happen to have a misdemeanor warrant. He was booked on that warrant. <laughs> Sorry? It was, uh, it, was, it was in the middle of the room on a table in, in a bag. Were you able to ascertain whether or not it was a suspect or police who fired first at a shootout? And if, is it clear to you if these suspects um, had the intent of to die there? I don't know if I can speak to their intent on that. Um, it's my understanding they opened fire first. I, um, uh, rounds came out of the, the back of the car from the, uh, the female that was in the back firing through the back of the SUV at the, at the police vehicles. And then the male suspect who was the driver got out and then fired at officers from the street as well. I don't, I don't know who fired the first round. I'm going to let the FBI, that, that's, a, that's a part of the investigation that they're working on, and so they're doing up the history on that, and I just don't have enough of, uh, well, info about her. Did the stop on its own accord, or did it, was it disabled? Uh... Uh, I believe they st it stopped on its own accord to engage the officers. Now, what does this mean going forward? Just, I know you can't talk about county buildings, but, but city buildings. Uh, I know this is you know, probably a, a, a fluke, but what about security at, at, at city buildings? So we, we stepped up security all across the city and all across the county yesterday at all of our city and county facilities. Schools went into lockdown today. To my understanding that as of today, based upon the information that we have no credible threats, that a lot of those facilities are returning back to business as usual. So but yesterday, everybody went into a lockdown. We're not going to see people with rifles in, in front of City Hall ongoing. No, I don't, I don't anticipate you will. We, we've also... What's that? I don't know. We'll try to get those answers later on. Later on. Actually, I'll let the sheriff address that from the county. Last night, the county board of supervisors held a special meeting and decided to make the decision to shut down the non-essential county departments for today and tomorrow. Not only to make sure that there weren't any threats that were still potentially developing yesterday, but as out of respect for the family members and fellow employees that were either victims or friends of the victims. And that's the decision the Board of Supervisors made. So the non-essential county operations have been shut down for today and tomorrow. Chief, just to clarify, there's no suspects in connection in custody ever. Correct. Chief, are Thank the you, Chief. suspects families, are they uh, cooperating? Uh, it's my understanding we've contacted a number of them. They have been cooperative up to this point. I think there may be one or two that we're still looking for. Were these suspects wearing the cameras? Were they wearing GoPros? They were not. They were not wearing. I, I've heard that rumor about the GoPros. I've asked our staff about it. Nobody's located GoPros. Nobody's located any ev evidence that they were wearing cameras of any sort. Chief, do you know how many people were at the party? I don't. We are going to try to get that by later this afternoon, though. Have the family members been formally interviewed about what they knew? Several, several of the family members have already been contacted, have been interviewed, and are cooperating. We're still looking for a couple of others. Is there if the women work? I'm sorry? Did the women work? Is there anything more known about that? Um, I don't know anything about that. Yes, sir. So. Sure. Uh, the coroner's office is now having to handle 14 bodies at once. What, what, what impact is this having on uh, the, the coroner's uh, operation? As you, know, as you know, I'm responsible for the coroner's office as well. And our staff is on 12-hour shifts, and we've called folks in from their days off to assist with processing the scene and helping to identify the victims of this tragic event. We're in the process of making those identifications. The majority of them have been done, and a number of the, uh, the notifications have been made, and we'll continue to update you as we get that information, and we can provide the names once the notifications of the next of kin have been made. Will that be on the website? We'll probably release it through a press release through our public affairs division as we get that information. Thank you. Two, two more questions, we're going to wrap it up. Does the wife have relatives in the United States? Uh, not that I've been told. Pakistan. Thank you very much, folks. We'll, uh, we'll be in touch with you today.
Well, the uh, chief of police and the county sheriff in San Bernardino there taking uh, journalists through the details of Wednesday's mass shooting at a social services centre, the deadliest for three years, of course, in which 14 were killed and 21 injured. They talk of a massive haul of weapons, including uh, 12 pipe bomb-like devices and thousands of rounds of ammunition are found at the home of the couple suspected of carrying out that mass shooting. Uh, when asked by journalists whether the couple planned to carry out further attacks or Sponsors that they certainly had the ammunition to do so. Well, the city police chief, Jared Bargan, also said that the four guns were legally bought. Well, on that point, let's bring in our uh, uh, North America editor, John Sopel, who's in San Bernardino for us. Uh, John, I know you were just listening to that press conference, as were we. On that point that the suspects bought their guns legally, President Obama has spoken in the wake of this, reiterating the point he's made time and time again, that it's simply too easy for people in the States to get hold of guns. But what can he realistically do if we know that people are buying these guns legally? Well, there are two aspects to this investigation, aren't there? There is one, the ease with which people are able to get hold of firearms. And just to give you a kind of statistic, one statistic that stands out about you know the American appetite for owning weaponry last Friday Black Friday 185,000 requests were processed by the FBI of people wanting to buy firearms that is in one day so there is a huge ability capability just down around the corner from where we are standing now there is a gun shop but I think what is much more concerning to the authorities is what was the motive behind the people were these was this an, a disgruntled employee who decided he wanted to go and take it out on his co-workers that's beginning to look increasingly unlikely because if you just look at the planning that was involved the idea that there were three remote controlled pipe bombs I think that is what will give the authorities most concern that they didn't know who this person was and they didn't know the massive armory that had been amassed at his house and of course the uh, motive remains the huge question mark in this investigation police chiefs just now saying that they refuse to be drawn into defining this as an act of terrorism that was a question put to them by some of the journalists as you say they still don't know why this was carried out just of course days after three people died at that planned parenting clinic in colorado yeah but just look at language being used when the president says we can't rule out terrorism, it would be very easy in the early stages of an investigation if you're confident to say we're confident it wasn't terrorism. They're not ruling it out. And another kind of, just to give you an indication of what the authorities are thinking, this is now being taken over as an investigation by the FBI and not by the local police force. That suggests that they too think that there is something about this that is untowards. And so they're going to be, I'm sure, pouring over computer records, looking at Saeed Farouk's travel to Saudi Arabia, where he met his wife and the fact that they came back from there. I think those are the things that they will want the most detailed investigation about. In the meantime, though, of course, you have another community traumatized by another mass shooting with 14 people dead and you know, maybe 21 seriously injured. Of course, and we'll keep our viewers up to date as this investigation continues. For now, John, many thanks. John Sopel there, our North America editor in San Bernardino for us. Well, we'll have much more for you on this later. But for now, two FIFA officials have been arrested in Switzerland on the day that its leaders accept reforms to the way the organisation is run. It's quite clear that the worst victims of this disaster are the poor people living in the slums which have sprung up around the factory. I am feeling so helpless that uh, the children are dying in front of me and I can't do anything. Charles Manson is the mystical leader of the hippie cult suspected of killing Sherm Tate and at least six other people in Los Angeles. At 11 o'clock this morning, just half a metre of rock separated Britain from continental Europe. It took the drills just a few moments to cut through the final obstacle. Then Philippe Cosette, a miner from Calais, was shaking hands and exchanging flags with Robert Fagg, his opposite number from Dover.
Hello, you're watching BBC World News with me, Alice Baxter. The latest headlines. Police in California have been giving details of the massive haul of weapons found after America's deadliest mass shooting for three years. No motive has been established yet. The American Defense Secretary has announced that all U.S. military combat jobs are to be open to women. The historic move comes after several years of study and plans to wipe away generations of limits on how and where women can fight for their country. Women will now be able to contribute to our mission in ways they could not before. They'll be allowed to drive tanks, fire mortars, and lead infantry soldiers into combat. They'll be able to serve as Army Rangers and Green Berets, Navy SEALs, Marine Corps Infantry, Air Force Parajumpers, and everything else that was previously open only to men. And even more importantly, our military will be better able to harness the skills and perspectives that talented women have to offer. No exceptions was the recommendation of the Secretary of the Army, the Secretary of the Air Force, and the Secretary of the Navy as well as the Chief of Staff of the Army, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, Chief of Naval Operations, and the Commander of U.S. Special Operations Command. Well, our correspondent Barbara Plett Usher is in Washington for us. And uh, Barbara, this announcement by Ash Carter, the American Defense Secretary, is being described as historic. How big a deal is this? I think it's quite a big deal, Alice. It opens up more than 200,000 positions to women that were formerly closed. And you heard the Secretary of Defense listing there some of the things that they will now be able to do. But at the same time, this is something that has been going on gradually over quite a long period of time, and especially over the past three years, because in January 2013, the Army lifted its ban on the final restrictions of women serving in combat roles, direct ground combat. But it then gave time to the leaders of the different military services to study how this would work to ask to see whether they'd like to request any exceptions and to argue for those exceptions. Um, only the military or the Marine Corps, sorry, did ask for some partial exceptions. And the Secretary of Defense said that because it's a joint force, he had decided to make this a decision across the whole, across all the forces. Uh, and he said that was because mainly uh, the the U.S. military had to draw from the broadest pool of talent and just couldn't afford to cut off. 50% of the population. He also said it's a decision that reflects um, what has been happening, especially during the Iraq and Afghan wars, that women have been serving in combat roles, they have been flying fighter jets, they have been uh, in submarines, and they have been paying with, uh, with their lives. They've been killed and wounded. And now they will be uh, officially uh, allowed to apply for uh, these roles that have been closed to them before. Barbara, for now, many thanks. Barbara Plett Usher there for us. Now, as football's world governing body, FIFA, unveils plans aimed at cleaning up the way it's run, two more senior executives are under arrest. FIFA's executive committee has adopted reforms, including restricting its president to a maximum of 12 years at the top and tighter integrity checks on senior officials. But what timing? Just a couple of hours earlier, Swiss authorities raided a hotel in Zurich and detained two FIFA vice presidents as part of an ongoing bribery investigation. Well, our sports editor, Dan Rowan, is outside FIFA's headquarters in Zurich for us. Dan, what a day for FIFA. Let's uh, talk, first of all, about these two arrests. Well, these uh, gentlemen aren't household names, perhaps, but they are effectively uh, the two most powerful football administrators in the American Confederations, Alfredo Howitt uh, of the North Central American Confederation, including the Caribbean, and Juan Angel uh, Naput, who uh, represents the South American Confederation, Conmebol. Uh, these two gentlemen were meant today to be discussing that crucial reform package that you mentioned there, which is seen, I think, by many as representative of FIFA's attempt to somehow rebuild public trust and confidence in it after a scandal-ridden few months and another proposal to expand the World Cup, quite a controversial proposal actually, to expand it to 40 teams by 2026. That's seen as something of a sweetener to certain associations around the world in order to try and tempt them to, to vote for those reforms. Instead, those two senior officials languished this evening in a Zurich jail, having been uh, swooped on uh, in a dramatic dawn raid by Swiss police earlier this morning. It's all reminiscent, isn't it, of the activity, what, six months ago, back in May. 
when that uh, those dramatic dawn raids resulted in a number of other senior football officials uh, being arrested, taken into custody. And that really did set off the chain of events that's led us here. Set Blatter, of course, FIFA's president, currently suspended. A new presidential election scheduled for February of next year. FIFA is desperately trying to look forward, but events like today's uh, prevent it from doing so. And in the next few minutes, we'll learn a little more from the US Attorney General, Loretta Lynch. She's the woman in charge of this uh, investigation, effectively. She's holding a press conference shortly, and she's expected to confirm that the scale of this inquiry is effectively doubled in size. Well, Dan, as you say, it's been a scandal-ridden few months for FIFA, to put it mildly. So many are asking, uh, can any amount of reform actually help FIFA, or does the body itself uh, need to be overhauled or potentially replaced? Well, there are some who believe that uh, so tainted now is FIFA as an entity, it should simply be wound up. It's uh, similar to a failed bank and that uh, there's simply no hope for it. Something new needs to happen, a new organisation, a new world federation, whatever form that may take. Others believe there is hope for FIFA if the right reforms are brought in. But certainly the next few weeks and months could prove crucial. And of course, the big decision that FIFA has to make ultimately is who should lead it going forward. OK, Dan, for now, many thanks. Our sports editor, Dan Rowan, there for us outside FIFA's headquarters in Zurich. Don't forget, you can get in touch with me and some of the team on Twitter. I'm BBC Baxter. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching.